If you listen to the show, you already know that we cannot exist without our sponsors. They are the ones who make things happen behind the scenes. So let's acknowledge Fuji Sports. We've been working with these guys for a while now, not only as far as this podcast is concerned, but also at the Roll Academy. We've had their gear. I personally use their geese. What a phenomenal product. Yeah, I mean, jujitsu, judo, MMA, um, tape, bags, anything you need for your jujitsu journey. You can find at fujisports.com. Let's talk Roll TV. There's so much content on there. It's ridiculous at this point. But I think what is even more intriguing, as time went on during the project, we've been recording most of the events that were taking place here at Roll Academy. At this point, I mean, we have guys like Chris Howder, Armin Fadi, Rafael Lovato Sr., and, and Pete the Greek. I mean, there were so many different events that we've kind of recorded it. Don't you think that's amazing? I mean, points of reflection and kind of going back for all the students to see what really happened and refresh their memory. Yeah, I think it's great, you know, being able to go back and look at all these high-level practitioners, uh, Octavio Kudo, like uh, one of the names you didn't mention. And I mean, just these guys that have been doing this for so long come in, uh, teach these amazing seminars and workshops, and it's all recorded and there for you to watch. Yeah, absolutely. So if you want to get additional savings on all this, type in code ROW Radio at the coupon and get additional 30% off of your membership. Nice. Go to rollacademy.tv. What's up, everyone, and welcome back. If you haven't already, please remember to hit the like, share, subscribe, download, listen, and whatever other button there is, and leave us a review wherever you do listen. That ensures that we can continue bringing you the great guests and amazing content that you have come to expect. Today's guest has trained in 27 martial arts over the span of four decades. He has trained under legends like Danny Insanto, Orion Gracie, Joe Marrera, Hicks and Gracie, and the Machado Brothers. He has also brought structure and a promotion system to BJJ that has produced incredible black belts, including Roy Dean. On this episode, Roy Harris joins us to discuss his martial arts journey that started in the basement of a Chinese restaurant over 40 years ago, the reason he brought testing instructor to BJJ, his plans for the future, and so much more. Here's the Roll Radio with one of the earliest Americans to receive a BJJ black belt and a true martial artist in every sense, Roy Harris. Welcome to Raw Radio. And we are live. Here we go. And we are back at it again. Yeah. Man, I was sick yesterday. Oh, I don't. Well, I hope I'm not sick or no. getting sick now. I, listen, I feel fine now, again. but like yeah. day before, yet was it yesterday? No. Yeah. No, oh, do you, uh, I know why. I know why. Because we went to our, our work dinner and you had a couple cocktails. And they don't do that, that anymore. Well, but the, no, like I was coughing and, and oh, okay. it, it sore throat and like I felt weak. And like Sunday, I literally slept all day. It was yeah. ridiculous. Like I, I rarely do that. And like, and then even yesterday, like I, I asked for one of my classes to be covered and, you know, I kind of chilled back and I napped again. Like the amount of time that I slept in the last two days is ridiculous. Is it? Uh, maybe it's age related. <laughs> <laughs> is that what? <laughs> yeah, you're getting up there. You're finally catching up. But with my people big, like me. My biggest fear was because I'm supposed to go to Boston. Oh this yes, week. don't get sick. And like yes. you can't get sick no. when you're filming instructional. So no, don't get sick. <laughs> it's, like it's, yeah. it's it was uh, you know. But I'm 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 back. I'm I'm glad yeah, to be here. I was actually looking forward yes, to be important. back. Yeah. How did the Lego building thing worked out? Uh, it was fine. In and was out. it? Yeah. He was my boy. Was disappointed he couldn't get the two hundred dollar Lego set he wanted. Oh, uh, <laughs> but that's only because only because it wasn't an official Lego store. Uh huh. Uh, and we have a gift card, so he's gonna get it. Oh, just order it. Well, for good him. for him. So, but good for him. A couple crack. Crocodile tears. A cup of crocodile yeah. tears. Yeah. yeah. It's funny because we hang out every single day so much and then I run into you at the Lego thing. And yeah. it's like, oh my God. I can't get away from this guy. <laughs> so, well, let's bring our guest in. So we'll have uh, a different topic and different takes to talk about other than ourselves. <laughs> That's right. So once again, one of the pioneers of, of jiu-jitsu and martial arts world, world uh, Mr. Roy Harris. Thank you for being here. How are you, sir? 
How is your Thank you so going? much for having me. I'm doing well. So I think what's interesting, you know, about you is that one, you've been on the mat as I'm calculating, you've been a black belt for 25 plus years. Is that correct? Yes, I've been a black belt since uh, January of 98. Nice. That's a long time. <laughs> yes. How has the black belt perspective changed over those few decades? Tremendously. It's changed because, like everything in life, things change, people change, culture changes. <clears throat> and so I got involved in jiu-jitsu back in, in the Brazilian jiu-jitsu back in 1991 because my Jeet Kune Do instructors were telling me, you're good at these other things, but you really need to focus on the ground. You suck at the ground. <clears throat> and so when I got involved in jiu-jitsu in 90, 1991, it was very different from the jiu-jitsu that was 10 years later in 2001. And now here we are, what, 32 years later, and mm -hmm. jiu-jitsu has changed so much. Uh, I think there's been a lot of good um, innovations that have taken place in jiu-jitsu, but I also think there have been some... Um, distracting injurious innovations so before we um, before we talk about the evolution let's let's go back let's go back okay. a few few decades back you've done many things prior to brazilian jiu-jitsu yes how, how did it all start do you remember your very first day very first interaction with martial arts yes i do i started martial arts in the basement of a chinese restaurant with a waiter who uh, practiced and studied Wing Chun Kung Fu. Nice. That's very... And uh, so... That's like that one of those <laughs> legends in the basement of a Chinese restaurant that's like a movie, yes. you know? I, I'll, let you, I'll let you continue that. How, how did, it, how did <clears throat> that start? How, how did you end up, first of all, how did you end up in the restaurant basement <laughs> doing martial arts? <laughs> so uh, where I grew up, I was kind of... Uh, picked on and pushed around and spit on and called names and beat up. And so I wanted to learn martial arts, self-defense. Parents said no. So after I moved out on my own, I went to a bookstore and picked up a book by some unknown guy by the name of Bruce Lee. <laughs> and that uh, guy. <laughs> yeah, that Never guy. Heard of him. <laughs> and started to study from a book and then through a friend of a friend of a friend, I heard there was some uh, waiter at a restaurant who was teaching Wing Chun in the basement of this uh, restaurant. So I went to go meet him. He accepted me as a student, and that began my journey with and, martial arts. And how old are you at that point? Um, I am 19 years old. Okay, so so you were so you were a young man growing growing up. So you know what you have an idea what martial arts is, or you don't i mean how, how is that folding in your head i don't uh, in my mind all i was thinking of was i need to learn self-defense okay so in the place where i was uh, raised there was one martial arts academy it was a karate studio and uh you know i wanted to go to that place but my parents said no and when i got older moved out on my own i forgot about that place Asked some friends, hey, do you know of anybody who teaches martial arts? And a friend says, yeah, I know somebody. And I showed up at this uh, restaurant, basement. Uh, restaurant <laughs> um, wanting to learn self-defense. And it wasn't my thing because the instructor focused so much on doing forms. Mm -hmm. And that was okay. But I remember after like the third or the fourth class asking, hey, when are we going to get to self-defense? When are we going to get to, you know, somebody punches you or tries to tackle you or a knife and he says oh don't worry that comes much later so i stuck around for i don't know two months and then i moved on to uh, a different city and got involved in uh jeet Kune Do and filipino martial arts and and then yeah, the, rest, just, the rest is a history the rest is history so is it safe to say that in your mind at that time, what you would consider self-defense wasn't necessarily what was being taught or considered at 
these martial arts places? It wasn't the same. That 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 connection wasn't quite linking. Exactly. I didn't know what I didn't know. Like now, when I talk to people about martial arts, I say, <clears throat> "Here's what you need to understand about martial arts." Saying martial arts is like saying vehicle. It's nondescript. Yeah. When you say vehicle, what is that? Is that an eighteen wheeler? Is that a Maserati? Is that a tricycle? Is it a motorcycle? Is it a bulldozer? So there's all kinds of vehicles and there's all kinds of uh, styles of martial arts which emphasize different things. Some styles don't even emphasize self-defense. Yeah, and I think that's the more interesting about martial arts in general. Like I even know at my academy when – uh, guests or vis visitors come in just to inquire about what we do and how we do it. A lot of them don't really know what Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is. They they yes. know, they don't know what self defense truly is. I often feel like the expectations. We are not even on the same planet. Like we mm -hmm. really have to educate as instructors and academy owners and just you know fans of of martial arts. We really need to educate. The, the general population of what we do and how we do it. Yes. Would, would you say the similar thing was back back then? Yes, I, I agree. All we knew back then was just the phrase martial arts. What did that mean? For the person who didn't know, it was just, well, I guess it's self-defense and there's the Japanese way and the Chinese way and that's all we knew. Yeah, and there is so much to all of this. So... At that point, a few months later, you move on to a Filipino-style um, martial arts. And how is that continuing on for you? <clears throat> you mean to the present day? Or? Yeah. Well, yeah, hmm. over, over the next several years. Like, how is how are you, you – are, are you discovering that, quote, unquote, self-defense that you have desired? Is that is that part of it at that point? <clears throat> What happened was, in my mind, was what started out as a journey with self-defense, once I felt like I had enough tools in my bag to be able to handle myself, the training became more of a focus on, hey, this is a great hobby. I'm enjoying the stick work, the knife work, the empty hand work, the grappling work. I'm enjoying all of this. And so self-defense kind of morphed into a hobby. And then the hobby eventually morphed into a passion, and the passion eventually became teaching. Interesting story about teaching is I never had any intent on teaching. And what started teaching was uh, I was working at a hotel here in San Diego, and a drunk patron got upset with me and threw a punch at me. I took him down to the ground, and, well, I did this in front of a bunch of uh fellow employees, and they thought because I was soft, quiet, easygoing, that I was a pushover, and they didn't know I knew any martial arts. <clears throat> so what ended up happening was a whole bunch of employees asked me to teach them self-defense on the roof of a Holiday Inn hotel. <laughs> <laughs> so you went from the basement all the way to the roof in your journey so yes. far. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you said you never intended teaching. Yes. Why, why was that? It was something that just never occurred to me. I mean, I was, had studied with a bunch of different instructors, but seeing myself as an instructor, seeing myself teaching, I never saw that. I was just interested, not interested, fascinated in the way that different styles addressed fighting or self-defense. So it was just a really passionate hobby for me. I think many, and I, I'm curious your perspective on this, but I, I, I do think that many instructors, um, even these days, in their earlier time when they are just starting the journey, ma many of them don't have desire to teach. Many yes. of them don't have, they don't see themselves in that position of leadership and an instructor or a teacher or uh, somebody who would relay the knowledge to others or share the knowledge with others. Yet at some point, they pivot to that. At some point, we become a, you know, somebody who has a greater amount of knowledge than, than everybody else, and we are more than willing to share. And then this becomes like a next level passion. 
Mm-hmm. Have you have you found something similar in in your experience all throughout? Like I'm curious, what was that pivot point where I'm not this is not for me yet now it became and you are the one in front of the group. I think uh from both my personal experience as well as observing hundreds, thousands of students over the years, uh I think All instructors have this desire within them to share and to give with others, to help others. I know in my own personal journey as an instructor, when I have looked at uh, people that are potential assistant instructors at my academy, number one, I look for somebody who's got a great attitude, a great demeanor. Number two, are they helping others in class? And number three, do they help me around the academy? You know, the students who show up early and say, hey, sensei, hey, professor, can I help you with anything? They uh, take up the mats. They sweep the mats. They they help out. You see them helping people. When I'm busy teaching class, I will see them go over and talk to a prospective uh, student. And so I think all instructors at some level are givers. And the giving eventually comes out. Yeah, I believe it was Sanji Ribeiro that we had on the show, and he said, as much competition is a very selfless or selfish act. It's all about me. Being an instructor is a selfless act. It's nothing is about me. It's all about the students. It's all about the people who do listen to me and the ones who want to gain the knowledge that I'm trying to share. Yes. I believe the same thing, yes. Do you think that being instructor is difficult? Yes, because the <clears throat> here's my observation. I've been teaching martial arts since 1986, 1987. So I've been doing it for quite a long time. And some of my observations are, you know, people uh, love to promote us and demote us. They love to promote us because we are their instructor, martial arts-wise. But then what happens are the conversations that happen before class and after class, where, hey, man, can I talk to you? I'm having problems with my girlfriend. I'm having problems at work. I'm really struggling with depression or whatever the topic is. So we end up getting promoted from instructor to therapist, counselor, psychologist, then others want to demote us from instructor to friend because as an instructor, they won't ask us for certain things, but as a friend, they will say, Hey, I I know you charge a hundred dollars a month. Is there anything, any way you can help me out? And like this month I can pay you $25 a month. And, and yes. So yeah, being an instructor, well, let me say it like this teaching jujitsu for all givers. That's the easy part. The hard part is the stuff that takes place before class and after class. At my previous academy, this is no joke, I used to have people show up an hour to an hour and a half early before class because they would want to talk with me about something. I know. (laughs) And so there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing bad with that. But it's just, uh, it's a challenge being an instructor because now you get this promotion to elder brother, uncle, therapist. You listen to stuff and then people want uh, answers to difficult questions in life. And so, yeah, the easy part is the teaching. The challenging part is all the other stuff that comes along with it. Why do you think that happens? And I'm smiling. We are both smiling because, I mean, the same thing happens to me. I mean, even last night. And and don't take me wrong. I love hanging out with my students. I love that mm-hmm. interaction. I love the connections. Like there was an irreplaceable bond, I think, that we all have on the mat, regardless what martial art we are in. But you're right. We often get transitioned from that role of an instructor to a role of a friend or in in quotes friend or a therapist or a assistant or a something else or give me advice or something. Why do you think that happens? That doesn't happen anywhere else. I mean, you don't go to Starbucks and then 
start talking to the guy who's making your coffee about your deep well, problems. Your bartender, do you? you do. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think that happens at uh, on, on at the Jiu Jitsu academies? You know, one of my previous jobs, I was a private investigator. <clears throat> and boy, that job really opened my eyes to a lot of things that <clears throat> go on in the world that people are unaware of. And as a, having worked as an investigator for four years, I became accustomed to paying attention to people and habits and routines and gestures and things. And I've noticed that Within the industries where there is power or prestige, you get people who come in at kind of a higher upper level who are aggressive and they have something to prove. And, you know, we see this in law enforcement. We see this in psychology. We see this in medicine. <clears throat> uh, same thing happens in martial arts. People who wear a black belt are considered by people who really don't know anything about martial arts, they are, ooh, I better not start anything with him. So we represent people who have taken on struggle in life. We have embraced uh, blood, sweat, and tears, and we have earned this black belt. And as a result of that, we have something that they desire, they seek. And so they come to us because they want to learn martial arts, self-defense, whatever it happens to be. And then along the way, they're like, hey, I, I like this guy's demeanor. I like the way this guy speaks. I like the way this guy conducts himself. I'm going to present a problem to him and see if he can help me with this particular aspect of life. So we kind of rep represent a part of society that has power and influence but as much as i agree with all this i mean there is a certain level of, of of effort and sacrifice and grind that takes place with achieving a black belt we are not psychologists i mean i am not a therapist do you, well do you think that this is a little more unique to jujitsu because it's quote-unquote non-traditional um that the the jujitsu instructor is a little bit more laid back um, on the mats, the whole aspect of being on the ground, you know, we've talked about from time to time, where maybe in a more traditional uh, karate school, even Taekwondo or something like that, it's, it's, the you're, line is you're, drawn. yeah, there's a clear distinction between instructor and academy owner and buddy, you know, there, there, there's not as much bleed over. Yeah, I think that's a part of it, but I also see the same thing happening in other styles, especially in that um, martial arts has changed a lot over the last 30 years from my perspective. You have some people who they enter martial arts seeking something. Sometimes it's self-defense. Sometimes it's community. Sometimes it's exercise, sometimes it's validation, and uh, you add to that an instructor who is approachable, yeah. regardless of the style, mm -hmm. Japanese, uh, Chinese, Filipino, Malay, Russian. If you have an instructor who is distant, he's going to remain distant. But if you have an instructor, male or female, who is open and laid back, uh, students feel like I can, if I can say it this way, I can approach the throne yeah. and ask a, a more personal question. Yeah, sure. And I won't have my head chopped off. <laughs> yeah, and it, it is a very fine line between that distance and staying separated, not crossing the line, yet being very approachable. Because, I mean, you're right. Any non-approachable instructor really won't have a large class. They will, he will not have students come and listen to him, right? So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's such an interesting topic. Huh. Yes. Not, that's a head scratcher for me. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, so life goes on. At which mm -hmm. point you are being told, hey, you mm -hmm. suck with this ground stuff. You need to get to the, to the floor and you need to start learning this, even though you might be seen as an expert with the stand-up, with the striking, with, with the standing martial arts. At which point that change takes place for you? 
That takes place in the uh, late 1980s. It was around 87 or 88. Now, keep in mind, before I did jiu-jitsu, I had been involved in other grappling arts. I had been involved in judo. I had been involved in Aikido, in Aki Jiu-Jitsu, in the JKD, uh, Jeet Kune Do. Bruce Lee's Jeet Kune Do has certain elements of grappling in it. So I did some grappling before, but I really didn't like uh, ground grappling. And that was mainly because the people that I trained with were hardcore. When we did judo, when we did uh, the throws, a lot of guys did the throw and would land on you at the end of the throw. <laughs> that became really hard on the ribs. Yeah, that and, still happens in judo. <laughs> yes. And so after roughly about a year of that, I just said, you know what? A phenomenal art, but not for me. Too many injuries for me. And when I was in the uh, changing room, it smelled like Ben Gay. <laughs> and I saw all the black belts had knee braces and elbow braces and their fingers were taped. Uh -huh. yep. And so that wasn't for me. Then I got involved in kind of a similar style, Shuto, yep. which was a Japanese uh, method, kind of like the first uh, method from Japan that was uh, that was akin to the Bali Tudo from Brazil, uh, kind of similar to MMA in that it had striking and it had ground grappling. But those guys, they also trained really hard. And I just left training feeling sore and beat up. And I didn't like that feeling. Um, and so I just kind of pushed away the grappling element. But then as I'm training at the uh, Inosanto Academy in 1988, I believe it was, there was a guy there who was training privately with the Gracies in their garage. And he kept telling me about the Brazilians that would take you to the ground and choke you out. And my initial response was, yeah, <laughs> okay. Didn't really interest me because I had those visual images of being thrown to the ground and somebody falling on me and then a hard arm lock or a hard choke. <clears throat> and do it wasn't know, until... Do you yes. know what jiu-jitsu is at that point? No. Okay. You just know there's I, some crazy Brazilian guys training in the garage and it's happening on the ground. Okay. Yes, yes. So I just thought, no, that's not for me. And so three years go by and my instructors keep telling me, you suck on the ground. You need to learn more on the ground. Why don't you take a look at jujitsu? So I said, OK. And I took a look on uh, and I found the Gracie Academy uh, up in Torrance. And I remember my first lesson with uh, Hoyler Gracie, I can remember it like it was yesterday. Uh, at the time, I was around 208 pounds, 210 pounds. He was like 135, 138. So I weighed him by 70 pounds. And my size and my strength and my minimal knowledge of grappling meant nothing. And I remember him asking me, how do I escape this? How do I escape that? I remember sparring with him. And I felt like, man, Sparring with this guy is like sparring with a ghost. You go to push here, and he's over there. You go to turn to push here, and then he's behind you. And that lesson stood out in my mind. And so my two hour and two and a half, two hours and 40 minute drive back home, I kept thinking about this lesson with this small Brazilian guy. And I thought, man, if he can do that to me, I wonder what I can do, because I had some friends who were 280, 300 pounds. I wondered if I could do that to them. So that got my curiosity, and then I started. Walk me through the moments before that class, before that one-on-one -on -one session that you had. You walk up to the front door. You are about to walk in. What is going through your mind? Because my first real instructor, uh, Sifu Rick Fay of the Minnesota Colleague Group in uh, Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota, uh, he taught me a lot of uh, fundamentals that still stick with me. And the primary uh, mindset that he taught me was whenever you go to train with an instructor, always, always, always empty your cup. So my previous background in training, did not matter. What mattered was I wanted to see what this new style had that was different 
than the other styles that I had trained with. And I wanted to see, you know, in my mind, am I going to get beat up like I got beat up in Shuto and in wrestling and in, uh, in judo? And it was much easier on the body. So, yeah, my mindset going into that was more of curiosity. What a big lesson, right? Isn't it? Going yes. into, because at that point, how many years of experience of martial arts do you have? I had 10 years. 10 years. I mean, that's a yes. substantial amount of time to be on the mat practicing what you are essentially, well, some would even consider an expert, right? At that, that decade of time, that's a substantial amount of time. And then you putting yourself in this very vulnerable position where you say, well, wait a minute, I'm going to put all of this aside and I'm going to go check this new thing out that everybody's mm -hmm. talking about. And then you're going through this experience of essentially training with a ghost, as you describe. How long was yes. that session? Uh, it was an hour. An hour. And how long have yes. you, you went through, I assume, through some techniques and other things, and how, there was a sparring part of it that you mentioned. How long is that? <clears throat> I think that was like the last six to 10 minutes, something like that. <laughs> Isn't that so, mind blowing how, yeah. But so going back to that time, I know you're uh, not that much older than me. And when I was starting, um, it was, everybody was very close minded and it, was it just luck, um, that you had all these instructors that would tell you like your first one to empty your cup. Um, and that, you know, you have people in, in like, you know, Dan in Asanto telling you, you suck on the ground um, was it luck that you had these people that were open to all these different styles or was that something you had sought out and, and would leave other people if they didn't have that mindset? Uh, my first instructor, Sifu Rick Fay, really laid a foundation because he said, no one man knows everything and no one style has all the answers. Therefore, I want to encourage you to take a look at different styles, how they address the same problems that we all have. And I want you to uh, find your own path, find your own way. And so as a result of that man teaching that to me, I was involved with, I've been involved with 27 different styles of martial arts with 51 different instructors. And I know when I say that, some people kind of rolled their eyes and go, oh, gosh, you just dabble. It's like, well, I have in every one of those styles at least a year to a year and a half of experience. A year to a year and a half, three times a week, plus a couple times a week on my own. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of experience that I have with Wing Chun, with Aki Jiu-Jitsu, with Shaolin China, with Russian Sambo. Um, Jiu-Jitsu stuck with me for some reason, don't know. Uh, when I first started, the initial goal was to spend two years, maybe three years studying the out, learn the basics, and go back to my thing. What's my thing? I'm a guy who I like to train and fight in the clinch range, roughly from where my hand can grab your neck, your hand can grab my neck, empty-handed and with a knife. And it doesn't matter whether you have a knife or whether I have a knife. Mm -hmm. I prefer that range. That's my forte. That's what I do better than jujitsu. So I went to jujitsu wanting to fill this hole of I suck on the ground. And here I am now, 32 years later, and still enjoying this amazing art. What I know you said you don't know, but I'm I'm curious if you can pause for a moment and mm -hmm. what is the one thing that made you made you stay engaged with jujitsu to this day? Um, for me, the mental challenge. Elaborate, please. Um, I am a very cerebral, analytical individual. Uh, for example, you know, I was born in the early 60s, and I remember... 67, 68, a grandpa bought me a transistor radio. And the first thing I did, I took a screwdriver and I took it apart. <laughs> that is my personality. I take things apart and I take things apart to the nth degree. Uh, 
For example, uh, something like the basic under the leg guard pass. When I present it initially to people who are just learning it, it's a series of five movements. Later, I give them some more details, and now it's a series of 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 movements. At the highest level, it's a series of 40 movements, 4 zero. There are that many details involved in this. Now, when I present it like this, very often people say, so do I need all 40 of those movements to be effective with jiu-jitsu? No, you don't. Here's the thing about uh, jiu-jitsu that is very important to learn. In my method of teaching jiu-jitsu, I teach a fundamental called equations. And one of the first equations that I teach people goes like this. Uh, poor to mediocre mechanics plus athleticism equals effectiveness. So you take the new guy who comes in. He's a white belt. He's uh, five foot eight. 240 pounds, wrestled in high school, wrestled in college. Last three years, he's been doing powerlifting and he's learning jujitsu. Actually, he's more adapting than he's learning jujitsu. And you're a seasoned blue belt. You got a year and a half experience as a blue belt. This guy puts you on your back, passes your guard, and captures you in a Maracana after just one month of training. You get upset. Why did I do that? You know, I've been training for a year and a half. This guy's only been training for a week. Well, because athleticism uh, is not king, but athleticism means something. So helping people to understand that there are certain qualities uh, beyond technique that can actually enhance your technique. This is a path that I've gone, to, gone down, especially with the, uh, the, the Jeet Kune Do. Um, but as far as the one thing, it's more of the mental challenge. It's about taking things apart, putting them back together. And uh, remember I talked about the basic under the leg guard pass with five movements. Mm -hmm. Some people, that's all they want. They just want, show me the basic, the gist, the essence of how to do this. I will add athleticism to it. And I'll throw the leg and pass the guard. And it works. And they're okay with that. Me, you know, I finished my 60th revolution around the sun uh, last year. And I can tell you 60 is very different than 50. Heck of a lot different than 40, 30. There's no comparison at 20. I don't remember. And so the body, <laughs> uh, things change in the body. And so what I do now is very different from what I did 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and especially 30 years ago. So, uh, yeah, the one thing has been this, this mental challenge of, how should I say, passionately pursuing leverage. Do you find that engineering a like mind is very common in jiu-jitsu? What, what I mean by that, that troubleshooting and really layering things on top is very common as far as, you know, studying and educating yourself in this beautiful thing that we do. Have you found that a lot of your students have a our mind like like yours where they can pick things apart and they can put it back together and then do it again in different ways? Many are like that. You know, uh, an instructor is a leader. Uh, I tell my instructors, uh, I tell my students, if you want to take a look at what an instructor is like, watch his or her students because – that old expression, fecal matter rolls downhill. Uh, leadership also rolls downhill. So if you see an instructor who's passive, easygoing, laid back, uh, you're going to find a lot of students that are attracted to that. They're going to stay with that because they love that. If you have an instructor who's more in your face and more aggressive and, and he's just like that, you're going to find that there's a lot of people who are attracted to that and drawn to that. Is one better than the other? I don't think so. For me, martial arts has the word art in it. Art is subjective. It's personal. You do a technique that way, I do a technique this way. Which way is right? Both. Which way is better? It depends. 
Depends on what? Depends on the practitioner, depends on the circumstances, depends on the environment. And so within martial arts, there has to be this leeway for your body type, your personality, my body type, my personality. I have people train with me who are four foot 11, 95 pounds. I have some other guys who are like six foot five, 281 pounds. I have a guy who trains with me who's uh, going to be 79 years old in a, 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 a few months. And so there can't be this one method fits everyone. There has to be leeways to allow for personality, body type, those kind of things. Be, being in so many martial arts, do you see the same approach in all the other ones? Or is this very jujitsu specific? I mean, this room for interpretation, this fluidity, this, 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 there's no one way. There's many ways of achieving the same thing, depending on all these things surrounding us. Have you found the same thing in the other arts or is this? Yes. Yes. Same thing in, in all the arts because uh, martial arts boil down to its essence is movement. And uh, movement uh, is the same for your body as it is for my body. However, my body may have more restrictions because of injuries or surgeries. Your body may have greater ranges of motion because you really got into fitness and mobility training. And so at the essence of martial arts is movement. And so whether it's a Chinese style or a Malay style or a Russian style or whatever style it is, it's a human being who's moving. Beautiful. 20 styles, more than 20 styles under your belt. You said mm -hmm. more than 50 instructors yes. that you have studied under and interacted with. Is there mm -hmm. a style or instructor that you haven't interacted with or studied and you would like to? Yes. Um, one of the styles that I, <clears throat> I still keep looking at, I may or may not get involved in it. I don't know. At this point in time, I lean towards, uh, I don't think so. <laughs> but one style that fascinates me is capoeira. Because oh. capoeira has uh, certain similarities to jiu-jitsu conceptually in that there are instructors and styles that are more about fighting and, well, fighting. There are others that are more concerned with art and flow and the beauty of movement <clears throat> and many of the couple other practitioners that i've met they are very laid back easy going some of them are brazilian and so they remind me of some of my jiu-jitsu instructors they're laid back easy going but then you, when you watch them move you see the beauty of the art but you also see with certain styles like the angola style is really powerful and it's focused on fighting so capoeira is definitely one of the styles i would like to look into and then uh indonesian silat there's a couple of styles of silat that i would like to look into because they are very very different than what we're used to here in the west and so many would think that at some point, this journey stops and we know everything. And mm -hmm. yet you talk about gaining more and learning more and studying more. What a huge inspiration uh, to me personally. Um, you know, after so many years being on the mat in so many different arts, impacting so many people, have you sat down and kind of reflected on it? how many people you have personally impacted over these decades of training and studying, educating, just even being there as a personality of martial arts? Yes, I have sat down and, uh, you know, the cerebral, nerdy, geeky, OCD <laughs> part of me, <laughs> I have sat down and written out about my impact and for me, the most meaningful and memorable experience that I've had in martial arts is not so much revolving around martial arts, it's revolving around life. 
I've had people call me in the middle of the night. Hey, Mr. Harris, you got a few minutes? Hey, I'm thinking about taking my life. This happened to me, that happened to me. And to talk that person out of pulling the trigger, to wrap my arms around that person and say, hey, man, I'm always here for you. To the, uh, I got so many, so many uh, experiences of phone calls at two or three o'clock in the morning of people who needed help. These people came to me because one, we were involved in martial arts training together, but more importantly, they saw a person, a human being who would listen, who was compassionate, and who would take time to help them go through some of life's more difficult challenges. And so to me, martial arts has been a tool for me, not only for personal self-development, but also for the lives I've been able to touch outside of martial arts. Do you recall one that you are willing to share that really sticks close to you over the years that that interaction created a, you know, a very irreplaceable bond with you and the other person? Yes, I remember uh, someone calling me, and I will speak very generically. That's fine. I remember someone calling me uh, because their spouse was abusing them and had been abusing them for six years. To make a long story short, I worked with this person for 18 months to finally get them to say, hey, Unfortunately, because of the distance between you and I, there's nothing that I can do from my location. You need to call the police. And finally, after 18 months, they decided to call the police and the police were brought in. The person was uh, handcuffed and they appeared before a judge and make a long story, another shortening the story. The judge basically slap the back of their hand and uh it started again the abuse started again and the phone call started again and i said hey you need to you need to deal with this and uh, you need to call the police and so the police were called and this time the judge who initially told the person uh if you're in my court again i will throw the book at you and fortunately when this person appeared uh for his for their arraignment, uh, the second time, it was with the same judge. And the judge threw the book at the person, and the person I was able to help, I was able to help them find some uh, counselors, to find some help, and to find a group of people who would nurture them and love them back to a full life. And to this day, we still keep in touch. And... uh, I'm very thankful that they felt confident enough to talk to me and involve me in their life. And they're very thankful that I was willing to listen and help them through this dark area of their life. And um, yeah, I, I'm thankful to have been a part of this. Yeah, what a, what a huge impact. And I, I mean, we're not talking about giving advice, but there's a life changing event over a long period of time. So, um, I mean, what a beautiful ending, I suppose, to, 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 a, to such a story. Many consider you a pioneer of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Many mm-hmm. consider you an individual who paved the path for, um, you know, a, a, a generations at this point. Um, many see you as the individual of uh, part of that dirty dozen. And, and I want to mm-hmm. dip into that a little bit. There is a little gray area over there, and I figured might as well ask directly from the source. <laughs> you know, some yes. say that you are part of the Dirty Dozen. Others say that you are not. And there are so many do- other lists. I don't think there's an official one. But wh- what are your thoughts on that? Um, <clears throat> this particular topic has come up uh, numerous times. People ask me, and I yeah. say, am I a part of it? I don't know. If I am, cool. If I'm not, cool. Uh, From my recollection, I'm number nine on the list. But some people say, no, you're number 13 or number 14. Okay. 
Uh, <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> it doesn't bother me either way. <clears throat> I'm thankful to, you know, have been a part of this journey. I'm thankful that, you know, back in the day, uh, there wasn't really a whole lot of structure to jujitsu. Yeah. And I was one of the first people to raise my hand and say, hey, where's the structure? And I kind of got pushed down. It's like, no, don't talk about such things. Don't ask such questions. And so when I got my black belt and I started to teach to the general public and do my own thing, structure was the first thing. So uh, am I a part of the Dirty Dozen? I think I am. But if I'm not, I'm okay with that. Let me rephrase that question a little bit. Yes. You are one of the first one who has received a black belt in, you know, who's non-Brazilian. Let's just keep it that way. At that time. At that time, when you are getting that black belt, do you realize the magnitude of that moment? Do you realize what this moment is going to paint for you in the future? No, I had no idea. I had no idea. I was just proud of the fact that my instructor uh, felt I was at that level. Uh, The real story behind that is he actually asked me, a year previous in 1997, boy, I want to uh, promote you to black belt. What do you think? And I said, uh, I'm not ready. Give me another six months. And so he waited almost another year. So I could have been promoted in 97, but I chose to be promoted in uh, 1998. But at that point in time, I had no idea what it meant. Let, let me ask you this, because I think this is going so far back at this point that, you know, things are the... the requirements and the promotion system is slightly different than what we are experiencing today. Are you at that point or, or are you a brown belt at that point? Or how, how is that, how is that unfolding from, from a ranking perspective? I was, uh, I was a brown belt. Uh-huh. I started my journey in uh, January of 1991 in uh, April of that year, I got promoted to blue belt by Horler Gracie. <clears throat> in August of 94, I got my purple belt. Um, September, October of 97, 90, no, 96, I got my uh, brown belt. And then in January of 98, I got my, uh, my black belt. <clears throat> and so I was a brown belt at the time. And on the mat, I was amongst Professor Marrera at the time, amongst his students, I was like one of the top three guys. And back in the early days, there weren't big tournaments. There were only in-house tournaments. I remember some tournaments at the Gracie Academy. I remember in-house tournaments at uh, Kleber Luciano's place and uh, Joe Marrera's, even the Machado's. Uh, so back in the day, there were a lot of in-house tournaments. There weren't any big tournaments. And I had competed 25 times. And out of those 25 times, I won 20 or 21 matches. And so, uh, yeah, I had no idea what this meant. I just knew that I love this art. And my instructor felt as though I was ready for the black belt. And he gave it to me. Did you know what was coming? Uh, yes, because he called me uh, a month before and says, boy, I'm going to promote you to uh, Black Belt. Awesome. You know, as I was getting ready for this conversation, I actually saw uh, for the very first time you and Jean-Jacques um, at some kind of tournament at a, at, or some kind of event. Do you recall that match? Yes, that was, the, that was in July of 1998, six months after I got my Black Belt. So that was the, uh, the Black Belt Challenge. Yes. What, what a great, I'm like, I'm drooling right now because like, I, I am so fascinated about jujitsu history and like even have this opportunity to talk to you and, and the fact, don't you find it amazing that he re, he's able to recall to every single yeah. date of, of all the events we are throwing at him or I'm throwing at him? Yeah. Did, That's the nerdy geeky OCD yeah. side of me. Is that, is that nerdy geeky OCD side of you why you brought more structure into Brazilian jiu-jitsu uh, as far as the testing. Because even today, a lot of people don't test. 
Um, you get it when yes. the instructor thinks you're ready. Um, but but you have very rigorous testing, uh, and it's all very structured, and it's been passed down from, you know, like to Roy Dean, and he carries that on. Yes, I brought structure to it because while uh, this is an amazing art that we're involved in, uh, the lack of structure, it doesn't bother some people, but for the people who are, who have uh, goals and purposes, it's like, okay, what are we doing? Why are we doing it? Is what are we supposed to get out of this? And so <clears throat> structure was just a part of my personality, a part of my genes. And I tend to attract people who like uh, structure and want to be able to see, A, where they're at right now, B, where they've come from, and C, what are the next steps to the future? Well, These are the people that I attract. Yeah, and I, I personally do appreciate all that because it's, you know, I'm... I'm all about structure, Jerry. <laughs> Gary knows. <laughs> Gary knows. Gary knows. Uh, yeah, it's just it's it. It seems it opens people up. I think a lot when they see it, like when they see the testing. Them, you know, on a, <laughs> they watch a video of it, um, and they realize, oh, maybe I need all these other things. I need to progress in certain ways, uh, and I think it it helps them because it is such a bizarre, not bizarre, but it. There's a lot of gray area here where you're like, am I even getting any good at this? Because like you said earlier, you know, this powerlifting wrestler comes in and wrecks you, you know, yes. and, and it's like, okay, where, where, where should I be? Where do I need to be? You hear these questions all the time. Mm -hmm. Oh, such a fascinating journey for all of us. Yes. Um, we've been doing this for, for an hour at this point. I know your time is very valuable, but before we finish up, what we do end of each episode, we have a question from a previous guest, but he mm -hmm. didn't know it was you who will be answering that question. So it mm -hmm. creates a, a very interesting end of the show. Mm -hmm. Gary has the question. Let's take a look, um, yeah. you know, as, as we dip into that. So this is from Amal Easton, and he wants to know, as you have gotten older, what has been your biggest challenge or obstacle? Um... <clears throat> In a nutshell, I have arthritis in C5, C6, C7. Um, and so neck injuries suck. Mm -hmm. Neck injuries kind of took me out of competition. Um, and it took me out of a lot of hard training. And so uh, injuries really... Injuries are both a blessing and a curse from my perspective. They're a curse in that they limit and they restrict you in one fashion. But in another fashion, if you allow it to springboard you into the future, you can make some huge gains. I'll give you an example. Uh, back when I was a purple belt, I remember I hurt my right knee somehow. And so I still continue to train. And because of my nerdy, geeky OCD ways, I thought of how can I train with a bum right knee? I know I developed something I called the one legged guard. So I made my right leg straight and I did all guard work with my uh, left foot, my left shin, my left knee, my left thigh, and both of my hands. And so as I have gotten older, I have noticed that. You know, I've got this problem with my neck and this problem with my right shoulder and my left elbow and my right ankle. <clears throat> so I've had to learn how to become more efficient. Thanks to my first martial arts instructor, Sifu Rick Fay, teaching me Jeet Kune Do, he drilled into my head, get beyond effectiveness and move towards efficiency, pursue efficiency. So I... Uh, for example, one of the things that I teach now is I teach people how to pass the guard and how to hold people down from the side mount with your arms at full extension. And there's no chest to chest or chest to back. I'm sorry, chest to chest or belly to chest contact. Nice. This yeah. is the most efficient way to hold somebody down from the sideline from the side mount because you don't need to hug. It is, it is almost mind-blowing in my mind how we can adapt 
to the situations based on the circumstances that we find ourselves in. And injuries often are, are circumstances that we can control, mm -hmm. right? This mm -hmm. is what I find myself in. So, like, I have two choices. I have to adapt to this, or I suppose I could quit and stop, right? Mm -hmm. Those who stick around, those are the ones who develop the evolution for themselves. Yeah. Look those, at those. Mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. I mean, there are so many. I mean, you can, you know, it, I, I think almost every single black belt is going through this experience in some capacity or some level, some more than others. But I think we are all forced to develop certain systems, if you will, because mm -hmm. of injuries or preferences or other things that we find ourselves in. And, and at the end, we become experts in this, in this area that nobody has ever experienced, right? Yes. Here's a fascinating observation. Because of the uh, injury to my neck and the pain that I experience from time to time, there's a particular technique in Wing Chun Kung Fu called Bong Sao, where you use your upper third of your forearm to push with and to frame with. As a result of my neck injuries, when I allow people to pass the guard, I no longer, well, I stop doing this. And I focus on this because doing the Bong Sao helps me to guard my neck. In one of my lessons with uh, Guru Dan and Osanto, uh, we sparred at the end of it, and uh, he says, uh, he goes, Roy, I, I didn't know there was so much Wing Chun in jiu-jitsu. It's like, <laughs> well, there's no Wing Chun in jiu-jitsu. You're the reason why there is Wing Chun in my jiu-jitsu, and because I have arthritis, I have to do this a lot to guard my neck. So, yeah, injuries can in some ways take us down, but injuries can also lift us up and make us more efficient in other ways. Would you say that he was one of the most impactful people in your life as far as martial arts? Uh, yes, the most. The most, because he is not only an encyclopedia of knowledge, but when you get a chance to talk with him privately one-on-one, -on -one, he's like... Uh, he acts like a person who doesn't know anything. He will listen to you talk about whatever, even though he knows a lot about whatever it is you're talking about. He will listen to you present whatever you're presenting. And that, to me, demonstrates humility. And that is what I aspire to be like. Guru Dan Nusanto is someone I admire and look up to and it's mainly because he knows so much he has so many different skills but one-on-one -on -one, he's so humble what a what a, what a pure it's leadership wonderful. definition yeah. of is he leadership. he's letting you find your own path at that point right like yes. you're, you're just you're you figure out your own answers it's like going to a therapist you start talking and you find that path uh and and you get there on your own which i think is yes. great it's wonderful before we wrap this up formally, what's next for you, sir? What's um, it, you know, what what what's the future holds for you? Are you how long are you planning on teaching? How play, are you retiring in any time soon, or what's the what's what's the future? I am planning on. I plan to teach until <gasps> until I take my last breath. <laughs> I hope when I when it's my turn to pass on. I hope I'm either teaching somebody jujitsu or swinging a golf club. Nice. So you're a, <laughs> yeah. so so, you're, so you're a big golfer, huh? You, you you play golf as well? I've been playing golf since I was four years old. I oh, wanted boy. to turn pro when I was uh, in my early 20s. Yeah, golf has uh, been a huge part of my life over the years. I had no idea. Wait a minute. Yeah. Wait a minute. So you gave up golf to do jujitsu. I just wanted to get that straight. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> we don't live so, yeah, with the regrets, I, but this might yes, be one there. Yeah, huh? yes. So what's next for me is I am starting to become hyper-focused on a small niche of people. I'm going after the hobbyists who are focused on longevity, safety, enjoyment, um, and these are the people that I want to impact the most. I will leave the competition stuff for the people who love competition. I will leave the people who like the 
artistic, let's explore, let's discover all of these new techniques, all of these new movements. My focus in the jujitsu that I present, the Harris Jiu-Jitsu, let me show you something. The Harris nice. Jiu-Jitsu logo, I oh. made this specifically because of this is how I teach. The here, the roots represent the foundation, the fundamentals. The trunk represents the B, the basics, the how-tos. The fundamentals have nothing to do with techniques. They lay a foundation for the basics. The basics represent the how-to, how to do a double leg takedown, how to do uchimata, how to pass the guard, how to do an arm lock. The branches represent the intermediate level. This is where a person starts to focus on, how do I turn this knowledge into a skill set? Knowledge is one thing. Skill development is entirely something different. And then the leaves, they kind of represent the advanced that deals with the neutralizations and the counters and tactics and strategy and all of that. And then the out of this world, this is my uh, method. I call it the FBI, AO method, fundamentals, basic, intermediate, advanced, out of this world. The out of this world represents the uh, programs that I teach to individuals and groups of people that have specific needs, like when I work with uh, special operators, when I work with pilots and the flight attendants who have to deal with people at 30,000 feet, when I deal with uh, female realtors who have to show a home by themselves at 7.30, 8 o'clock at night. <clears throat> and so... I'm going after the people who want skill sets and they want skill sets in shorter periods of time than the traditional way that uh, jiu-jitsu is presented. So that's where I'm putting most of the eggs in my basket for my future. And if anybody wants to learn more about this and more about you, connect with you, where can they find you? They can find me at uh, RoyHarris.com um, and just go to the contact page and send me an email. And uh, I get around 10 to 30 emails every day. So uh, send me an email. I'll eventually get back to you and, uh, and we'll talk. Wonderful. Sounds, sounds phenomenal. Sounds Fantastic. What, a, what an amazing conversation. Um, you know, I do want to say thank you for being here last um, 70 minutes or so and really sharing your journey, your, your wisdom, your experiences. What an irreplaceable moment uh, especially for me you know I, I, I 20 plus years when i met but you were one of the individuals i always looked up to you're one of the big names that always popped up and 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 what a, what a great honor for me to to share this last hour with you gary yeah i just i reiterate all of that and also thank you for your openness um that obviously was instilled uh very early in your journey uh and for carrying that with you and uh and just showing people that there's a lot of things that they can grasp from and take from and, and being open uh, and having a, a good mindset about that. So thank you very much. Well, thank you guys very much. I appreciate the opportunity to come on your uh, podcast and talk and share some things with you. And hopefully your viewers got, uh, got a little bit of knowledge that they can use in their own journey. Out I'm of sure it. they did. I'm sure they did. All right. Well, let's wrap this up for today. Thanks for being with us and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Raw Radio. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to leave us a review and help us make the show even more amazing. For future episodes, check out our website and follow us on all major podcast platforms. Take care.